All right, let's speak to Hatim Baziam. He's a professor of Islamic law at uh, the University of California. Hatim, thanks so much for joining us. What's your analysis of, of what we're seeing right now, the, the rhetoric, the boycott, the accusations? Just how damaging is it? Well, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, we also, I also have a, a center that studies and documents Islamophobia uh, in Berkeley. Uh, and what we're experiencing is uh, right-wing political parties uh, and also center of right political parties using Islamophobia and monetizing it uh, for votes at the ballot box. So it's not surprising to see Macron, who's beginning to plan for his next election cycle, uh, using Islamophobia as the Trojan horse uh, to run uh, for election and possibly begin to think of Marie Le Pen, who is definitely Islamophobic and her party has neo-Nazi origin, uh, to try to placate and possibly become more anti-immigrant and more, more Islamophobic in such a way to monetize it and to win elections. Uh, this is a phenomena uh, that we're uh, seeing across Europe is definitely a phenomenon here in the United States with President Trump. Uh, 2016 election victory was on the back of uh, using Islamophobia and stoking white resentment uh, to bring these voters into the ballot box. So this is the phenomena that we are seeing both in Europe and in the United States. What do you fear will happen if anti-Muslim prejudice is not targeted? Well, I think uh, studying Islamophobia and also creating the comparisons of historical anti-Semitism, uh, definitely we are seeing that Islamophobia is tipping toward violence. Uh, the incidents that we're seeing in Europe, the incidents in the United States, definitely the uh, Christchurch massacre in New Zealand uh, already demonstrate uh, that Islamophobia has tipped toward violence. More importantly, in some countries like in India or China, likewise, we see Islamophobia having a different dimension to it. So I think what we need is a systematic treatment of the problem. We need to uh, in, uh, involve civil society, in both from the Muslim world as well as Western uh, Europe and the United States, to say that racism, discrimination, repackaging uh, racialized uh, uh, construct relative to Muslims will eventually harm both Muslims as well as the broader society in general. And I think this is the moment for us to actually reclaim uh, civil society, reclaim uh, the pulpit uh, for those who don't use racism, discrimination, xenophobia, anti-immigrant uh, sentiments in order to arrive and reach uh, seats of power. And we need to actually say to Macron, that competing with Marie Le Pen for the bottom of the barrel by using xenophobia and anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim sentiments will only discredit you and, in, if anything, delivers the uh, broader French society to the far right rather than actually defending uh, the society from such encroachment uh, of right-wing neo-Nazi uh, political parties. I mean, it's interesting because here um, in Europe, the EU created an anti-racism coordinator back in 2015 to specifically try to tackle this kind of discrimination against Muslims. So, I mean, is that helpful? I mean, what else should be, be done? What should governments and the authorities be doing to try to tackle this kind of discrimination? Well, as we know, the European Union uh, Parliament in, uh, in Belgium has been weakened by the national uh, development in state by state. So we're talking about Hungary, Viktor Orban, we're talking about even in the UK with uh, the rise of Boris Johnson, who actually won on the, on the back of Islamophobia. We see the development also in the Netherlands, Austria, and currently right now is France. So what we have is the tension between the European Union and the European Parliament and then the nation states uh, which is increasingly trying to use anti-immigrant sentiment as a way to try to navigate and move toward the right. So th really the, the major crisis that is facing Europe is Europe does not have a trust of its own identity, of its own future trajectory, and using now xenophobia and anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim discourses as a way 
to uh, really debate the way to the future. And I would actually t uh, speak to both the Europeans and others that we already have a very uh, horrific period of the Second World War. And if we continue down this trajectory, we know what the consequences will be and that what we need is to pull back from the abyss and rethink how to bring about a, uh, a society that is embracing, that is inclusive, and to think of immigration and refugee problems, not a problem of people wanting a replacement theory, but rather a consequences of interventionist policies, of economic policies that have really run its course and have met it failure. So I think that's what we need to do in relations to uh, pulling back from uh, the uh, really the uh, the push toward a violent type of Islamophobia. Lastly, I would say that in tracing the Islamophobic incidents, almost 80% of all the violent Islamophobic incidents target Muslim women, both in the United States, in Europe, and other places. So we need to think of the gender dimension where Muslim women, on the one hand, they want to be saved by those who claim saving the Muslim women. On the other hand, they're used as a target for violence against women. And I think this is what you call the contradictions that we see today in, in Europe and also in parts of the United States. Okay, Hatim, thanks so much. Hatim Bazian, thanks for your time.